Assalamu alaikum everyone. Welcome to our Nagamiya Institutes of Islamic Medicine hosting this live stream event for you guys. Uh, we are first of all thankful for all of you who could join and some folks may also join. So my name for my introduction purpose, my name is Dr. Muhammad Ismail Shakeb. I will reside in Chicago. I'm a nephrologist and I'm in the board of Nagamiya Institute of Islamic Medicine. What NIMS is, 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 is a subsidiary of Imana. It's devoted to research and development of history of Islamic medicine. In 2019, it was renamed Nagamiya Institute uh, by the board of directors. Dr. Nagamiya, who will be the next speaker after me, is the, has been actively involved and is the one of the founders of NIMS, Nagamiya Institute of Islamic Medicine. He has been volunteering for a number of Islamic organizations locally. He's a member of founders of ISNA, the largest Islamic organization. He has served as a president of Imana in 1982. He's the vice chairman of International Society of History of Islamic Medicine uh, based in Qatar. Dr. Nagamiya has published and presented numerous papers on history of Islamic medicine. He's also publishing a book on this chapter. He has lectured all over the world on the subject of history of Islamic medicine, including USA, UK, Qatar, Libya, Tehran, UAE, Turkey, Pakistan, India, South Africa, China, Japan, Saudi Arabia, Jordan, Canada. So after careful discussion, he moved NIMPS to Chicago in Rolling Meadows, which is a suburb of Chicago. Dr. Nagamiya has given a lot of his time and commitment to this. And without further delay, I would like him to address all of us. He's one of the cardiovascular surgeons in Florida also. So, A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitan Rajeem. Bismillah Rahman Rahim. I welcome you all. Uh, we'll start with the Surah Al-Fatiha. A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitan Rajeem. Bismillah Rahman Rahim. Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. Rahman Rahim, Maliki Omidin, Ia Kanaudu, Ia Kanastain, Edina Seratal Mutatim, Seratal Lazina Namta Alehim, Veril Magdubi Alehim, Latolin. Amen. So, all of you, welcome. It is a great pleasure that we are having this first uh, webinar on NIMS, and uh, we are going to uh, very quickly present to you uh, the uh, Islamic viewpoints of dealing with the COVID-19 uh, that is so rampant in all over the world. As you know that uh, this has been a deadly disease and we have a huge number of people that are afflicted, over 3 million, and so many that are dead, over half a million. So uh, <clears throat> everybody has been worried about it. Everybody is uh, dreading the risk of contacting it and suffering from it. So uh, we will come to that. Uh, some of my other uh, colleagues will be uh, telling you. But I want to tell you a little bit about NIMS itself, how it started, what happened, and so forth. So let me uh, go on to the first slide. I hope all of you can see the first slide. Uh, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Uh, <clears throat> the NIMS, or what is called the Nagami Institute of Islamic Medicine and Science, is a project that's been undertaken, uh, was started off with the uh, very interesting episode. In 1973, a book was published uh, in England, which was sent to me while I was uh, doing my cardiovascular residency in Boston. It was called al -Bukhasis. Who was al -Bukhasis? So when I first received the book, I didn't pay much attention to it. But after a while, I started reading it. Then I found that al -Bukhasis was actually an Arab surgeon that practiced in Spain. And uh, here is a picture of him. Uh, so as, as soon as I read the book, I found out that some of the surgical operations that he had done were exactly what we do today. And uh, this was fascinating. He practiced 1,000 years ago. He was born in 930. 
and went on till 1013 uh, when he expired. In his short span of life, he accomplished a great deal. He published this uh, book, which is called Al Tasrif. It's a 30 volumes, and only one volume, the 30th part, actually describes the surgery. So this is a complete compendium of medicine, uh, which was uh, not only just a book, but it illustrates the ins instruments that he used in surgery. And some of the instruments he in invented, like for instance, the forceps. The forceps was first described by him. The uh, tonsillectomy knife was first described for him. So this set up my uh, <clears throat> ideas into motion. And in the year 1991, I presented a paper to the Imana Conference in Spain. It's true, I had gone to see uh, where Zahravi was born and uh, what he did, etc. So this was an expedition that I undertook. Uh, luckily, there was a, a conference uh, of Imana going on at the same time. And uh, I presented this paper, and it was uh, very quickly accepted by the uh, executive board. So the executive council then invited me to uh, uh, <clears throat> form an institute, and uh, they uh, <clears throat> put me in charge uh, against my better wishes. But they said that since you brought up the subject, you will be in charge of the and they named it the IIIM, or the International Institute of Islamic Medicine. So the uh, functions that were assigned to the institute including, included the collection of all the uh, material related to the history of Islamic medicine. It also was to correct a library. It was also to correct all the research publications. And it was to uh, build up an exhibit for of history of Islamic medicine. And it was to develop a curriculum for all the Islamic medical schools in the world, and maybe even non-Islamic medical schools on the history of Islamic medicine. When I started really uh, uh, going into the history of Islamic medicine, I found that there was a wealth of information. There had been so many things published. And when I started collecting the books, there was about 2,000 volumes that, uh, that we collected. That's what are being housed in our library at the moment. So we develop and maintain a website. We also are also trying to publish a book on contributions of the Islamic civilization to the development of medicine. And we are encouraging to develop a Islamic medical university and an Islamic medical school in the United States. As you know, some of the others have already achieved it. Our Jewish brothers and sisters have achieved a lot of uh, medical schools and universities and hospitals in this country. And there's no reason why we, as uh, we almost are about the same population, same size as our Jewish brothers. So what have we done so far? The IIIM has achieved quite a few things already. The library, as I tell you, has been created. We have about a thousand volumes in medicine and another thousand volumes on Islam in general. We have had many conferences. Uh, there were eight international conferences, several national conferences, and they were held all over the world, including Birmingham, England, Dubai, Hyderabad, India, Karachi, Kerala uh, in India, and so on. And uh, so many achievements have already uh, taken place. A uh, web page was created, which uh, uh, you can go and visit, and I'll give you the web address. Uh, there is a traveling exhibit, uh, which we created, which has toured uh, many, many cities in the United States and also uh, internationally. It's been acclaimed. The last exhibition was held in Guy's Hospital in London, and there were 300 doctors, English doctors, who visited and were admiring the the effort that was put in to collect all these exhibits. It was also exhibited in United Arab Emirates in Dubai. And we exhibited in Hyderabad, India, and in Kerala, India, and uh, also in Karachi, Pakistan. And we have, re we have received rave reviews regarding our exhibit. So it is a uh, lot of things that we have achieved. We 
but we are hoping to see a lot of field trips, webinars that we'll be arranging. This is the first of the kind. We'll be arranging workshop. We'll be giving lectures and courses. Uh, we'll be doing exhibitions and displays. Uh, we want to develop a museum. Uh, uh, permanent housing has already been uh, uh, <clears throat> found and been housed in Rolling Meadows, which is a suburb of Chicago. We are collaborating with other institutions like the uh, institutions in England and we are disseminating the knowledge of Islamic medicine. So mashallah, we have done uh, quite a lot of things and activities already. And uh, there are future aims and ambitions which will be discussed by Dr. Taj. And I'll hand over the uh, presentation to him now. Thank you. Thank you for listening to me. So our next presenter is Dr. Taj. We call him Dr. Taj out of love. He's Dr. Tajuddin Ahmed. He's a cardiologist uh, uh, practicing in, in Chicago, director of cardiology community hospital in 1973. Uh, I don't want to say my age, but I probably was not born at that time. So he's the founding member of Imana in 1967 in Columbus, Ohio. Imana stands for Islamic Medicine, uh, sorry, of North America, Islamic Medical Association of North America, first to join NIMS as a member and treasurer of both NIMS and Triple IM, the previous NIMS. He is also a member of ISNA, committee, founders of the Committee of ISNA, past president of AFMI, and uh, past president of Clark County Medical Association and uh, founder and president of Taj Foundation in not for non-profit educational orga organization. So there are so many things Dr. Taj and Dr. Nagamia has been doing for years that I, it's unfair to be given a job to me to do it in few seconds. But in all, we love you, Dr. Taj. We are looking forward to your vision. He's going to talk about the vision and goals of NIMS. Uh, so we can move it to his slides or uh, his presentation now. Uh, there are no slides that I'm going to present. A uh, lot of my talk has been very well covered by Dr. Nagamiya. So you all know the introduction. Uh, so I will not dwell into that, but few corrections. Uh, Triple IM was housed in Tampa, Florida, but we created uh, NIMS, Nagami and Islamic Medicine, in May 2018 uh, in Rolling Meadows. So it has become a non-profit organization, an offshoot of Imana. Uh, we, the, most of the work that was assigned to was accomplished. What all we did was to house these uh, in Rolling Meadows next to Northwest Suburban College. So anybody who wants to see our library and a museum that we have created, uh, they are welcome. Uh, definitely, we have a full-time, a part-time director, uh, Alia, who will give you the rounds. The idea was researching, recording, and reviving the knowledge and traditions of Islamic medicine, as Dr. Nagamiya pointed out, supporting a research, translation, and publication of literature about Islamic medicine, establishing, maintaining, and supporting the library of Islamic medicine in both traditional and digital format. I think we do have a physical library. We don't have the digital format yet. Disseminating the knowledge of Islamic medicine through conferences, lectures, courses, and discussions and encourage publications on the subject. This Dr. Nagamiya has well covered. Collaborating with medical schools to educate both students and faculty about its historical and contributions of Islamic medicine in the, gold, in the golden era. The vision always has been uh, to driven by desire to restore the field of medicine to the previously recognized and respected humanitarian science, practiced for the promotion and maintenance of health, healing the sick, 
prevention of pain and suffering and available to all regardless of color religion ethnicity gender or status in a society so these were the lofty goal plans are to enlarge our current facility and our collections uh, raise a million dollars towards an endowment fund we have more than half of it already uh, in our kitty so our job may not be that, that hard to have it so that we don't have any financial troubles in years to come so we do plan to organize an international conference in 2021 uh we are about to publish a book on various contributions of past and present muslims uh we are also trying to develop a virtual museum for the world to see and appreciate our work and the final goal has always been to establish a medical school and have our discipline further grow and be organized but for this reason we collaborate with northwest suburban college hopefully with all your efforts and prayers we may have one day our legacy of having an islamic muslim medical school in america thank you very much uh, we are now better off listening to our speakers uh, who are going to start the conference thank you very much thank you dr taj and uh, very good uh, insight and future vision of nims given by both dr nagamia and dr taj now i would like to move forward with our world renowned speakers three speakers and mashallah they have great credentials again i cannot do justice for them in one minute but alhamdulillah we know them they are strong people the, our next speaker is dr mohammad harzala He is a neuroscientist and a physician. He is the founder and director of Palestinian Neuroscience Initiative at Al Al Quds University in Palestine, and currently a research scientist at Rutgers University in USA. Coming to the most recent, Dr. Harzala was selected as a fellow of the Middle East Leadership Initiative and a member of Aspen Global Leadership Network. His work was featured by international media outlets including Forbes, Science Magazine, Nature and TED conferences. He received Dr. Rania Ramadan Young Arab Neuroscientist Award in 2011 and in 2013 he received the TED fellowship and was selected among the 500 most powerful Arabs in the world by the Arabian Business. Mashallah without further delay I would like Dr. Harzala to enlighten us with his knowledge. Uh, Jazakallah Dr Harzala please take on Thank you very much and it's a great pleasure to uh, uh be part of this um, esteemed uh, group of uh, scholars and scientists and doctors to be able to contribute although uh you know a small part of uh, what I've been trying to do uh, in terms of focusing on mental health uh to actually kind of um reflect a little bit on the current realities that which we're facing with the uh, with the covid-19 pandemic actually and how how that actually can we can reflect on it uh in these times and how can we actually seek the contributions of some of the you know amazing amazing scholars from the islamic golden age of science so this actually uh, leads me to as the following the following question so what is mental health and i think the best way to think about mental health is actually to imagine it in the context of its impact um so as per the world health organization it is thought that one in every 3 humans suffer suffers from a particular mental disorder for example you know it's estimated that 17 to 18% uh, of people worldwide suffer from an anxiety spectrum disorder The WHO again estimates that almost 300 million people suffer from clinical depression and so on and so forth. But these are these are statistics about the actual disorders. What is the actual impact when we talk about economically and from a disease perspective and from a you know a disability perspective? You will be surprised to learn actually that mental health problems are the first leading cause for disability worldwide. 
They're the second leading cause for mortality, especially when it comes to clinical depression. By 2025, mental health problems will be the leading cause for both morbidity, what we call disability, and mortality, death worldwide. By 2030, it is estimated that mental health problems will cost the global economy around $16 trillion. And this is just the tip of the iceberg. And even, even worse, this is pre-COVID-19. So what, where does this leave us? When we talk about mental health, when we talk about the current situation after or in the midst of COVID-19, how can we handle our own mental health? What does mental health mean? So if we want to define mental health very briefly, it's more of the capacity of thought, emotion, and behavior that allows us to interact with our societies, that allows us to actually express ourselves in our own environments, that allows us to deal with normal stressors in, the, in daily life activities, to stay productive, to contribute to community. Accordingly, you would actually imagine, so what are the determinants of mental health? And there are multiple determinants, it's not just one thing. It could be attributed to biology, to in terms of the brain circuits, in terms of the neurochemistry, the brain chemicals. It could be attributed to genetics, environmental factors, development, you know, ac according to the development and growth um, uh, in the lifespan of an individual. And accordingly, by knowing what is mental health, we can actually define what is a mental disorder. So exactly what I said but we add a disturbance. So disturbances of thought, emotion, and behavior that actually disrupt everything that I just mentioned. In the context of mental health, it's, it doesn't really stop at the level of speaking about disorders and mental health in particular, but we have larger constructs that we can actually focus on here. For example, happiness. Happiness is an integral part of what defines our experiences as humans. And if you think about mental health, happiness is an integral part of thinking about mental health. And happiness can be defined as a subjective satisfaction with life from an emotional and a perception perspective. Not only that, but another important construct comes in action whenever we think about mental health, which is called well-being, which is a general evaluation of satisfaction with life. So well-being, mental health, happiness have an interplay that would define our experiences that actually we call mental health that actually define us as humans. So mental health ends up being an expression of humanity rather than just a human right. The classical systems to actually assess and diagnose mental health and mental health problems used a binary approach, similar to infectious disease. So basically, if a person has a constellation of symptoms, they meet a particular criteria, then actually they could be categorized into either a patient with a disorder or a normal subject. However, this is not really very fruitful when it comes to the expression of mental health because anybody can have a particular expression of these symptoms. These symptoms are not a definition of disorders. These are sometimes normal emotions and normal variations of things that could happen to any of us. Any of us could be stressed. Any of us could have low mood. Any of us could lose sleep at night in the, in the current situation with, with COVID-19. We all feel uncertain. We all, we all, we're all scared. We lost pleasure. We're, we're you know, incarcerated at, at, at homes and we don't know how the next day will look like or the next week will look like. A lot of families and a lot of people lost their incomes and lost their resources. So is this a reason to actually diagnose these people with mental disorders? Not really and not necessarily because, again, as you, if you think about it, mental health becomes more of a multidimensional construct that is that encompasses all of these expressions of different symptoms rather than just a binary normal abnormal schism and this way we can actually kind of expand these normal disorder um, uh, categorizations to form some kind of a continuum that would actually allow us to entertain all of these variabilities and the multi-dimensionalities of the expression of symptoms and ag again what does define normal what does define disease? In mental health, there is, it's, it's very unlikely that we can actually pinpoint a particular definition of what is normal. And it's extremely important under the current circumstances to think that way, because in the face of stress, you will need to learn how to face it, rather than say, I have a problem. 
Along the same lines, happiness becomes very relevant here. So even with somebody who has these symptoms, it doesn't mean that they cannot be happy. They cannot feel the happiness. They cannot appreciate life along multiple perspectives. Again, think multidimensionality. Another really important construct that comes becomes relevant here is the aforementioned well-being, which basically encompasses the whole aspect of the variability in the expression of these symptoms alongside happiness. So somebody could have a mental disorder and still have well-being. Therefore, these constructs are completely dissociable, although overlapping. Let's take the following example and think about it in the context, where do these ideas and where do these constructs stem from, historically speaking? So let's imagine that somebody is suffering from a low level of mood, insomnia, avoidance, fear, and anhedonia. This is usually, this is a, a recipe that would actually qualify for the diagnosis of major depressive disorder. If these symptoms interfere and affect the person's daily life activities, but if they don't, then it's a normal vari variability, it's normal variation. But let's ask actually one of our scholars, one, one of, of the people who contributed to medicine as we know today, Ibn Sina. And how is it? he's actually, although he followed up on what was called melancholia by Hippocrates in the, in the Greek time, uh, he actually was the first in history to define this multidimensionality of symptoms. In his canon of medicine, in the third volume, in the fourth chapter, he talks about melancholia. And he talks about these different expressions of symptoms that actually lead to what we actually attribute today, in, the, in, in today's terms, what we call major depressive disorder. And this is the actual translation of it to English. So, inner clamor, um, uh, delight in solitude, quiet, uh, quick anger, fear. And he was the first to actually put them in perspective as a multitude of things. So basically we can thank Ibn Sina almost a thousand years ago for introducing a concept that we're starting to appreciate just today about the multidimensionality of mental health. Now just that, and I think we really should know our heroes. The word medicine comes from the Latin word medicina. And according to Professor Muhannad al Faluji, uh, who wrote Marjam al, al Firdaus for actually the, uh, the, the Arabic origin of English wor words in medicine, suggests that actually medicina comes from the Arabic expression medit sina, the topic of Ibn Sina. So the whole discipline actually was named after Ibn Sina. So where does this leave us? It leaves us with an appreciation of what mental health is all about. It's all about the multidimensionality. It's all about the variable expression of these symptoms. It's all about the variable, our ability to cope and our ability to actually appreciate and our ability to be happy and to entertain well-being under any sets of circumstances. And actually it reminds us of the great minds in the Islamic golden age of science who actually allowed us to see this light that actually lies in the, this variability of symptoms. Thank you very much for listening. Jazakallah, thank you, Dr. Harzala, for your presentation. Alhamdulillah. Uh, for the folks who are watching, if you have any questions, you can put in the live comments. Uh, Dr. Harzala will be back and address those questions at that time. So next, I will move on to Dr. Shahab Uddin. Dr. Uddin will discuss living the experience with suffering and dealing with COVID-19. He's a MD, board certified internal medicine doctor working in Chicagoland area. He has been treating COVID-19 patients since the beginning and has watched the evolution. He's also a physician executive working to create better standards of care and easing medical debt for patients in acute care. His side thing, charitable thing, he's the founder of Hyatt Relief Foundation, a non-for-profit working on projects in well-needed refugee camps, Bangladesh, and people who are distressed recently in Delhi riots and other needed areas. Without further delay, I would give the podium to Dr. Uddin, and he will cover the aspects of COVID-19 for you guys. Assalamu alaikum. 
can everyone hear me? Okay, I think we're good. Um, thank you, Dr. Nagamia, Dr. Dajuddin, and NIMS for doing this critical work. Um, as of right now, 160,000 people have died from COVID. Um, a recent survey that measured the uh, impact COVID-19 had compared to World Trade Center on the world dynamics, um, COVID-19 had a, by a much larger um, footprint on people's day-to-day -day life and everything they're doing. So this is a critical conversation that we're having. So inshallah, I will break this presentation into two parts, some brief treatment options, and then my experience with COVID. Uh, so you'll get two sides of the story. Like Steve, like Steve Bezos said, that PowerPoints aren't good. So I tried to keep it very uh, simple on the PowerPoint. Um, so I wanted to start with a timeline. So try to pay attention to what I'm saying because not everything will be in the slides. Um, so the first thing that happened was uh, the first case of COVID was found in January of 2020 in Washington. Um, working in the hospital, there was rumblings amongst the physicians like, do you think this is real? Do you think we should cancel our vacation? Do you think this is really happening? Um, but nobody sounded the alarm in uh, January of 2020. Then um, New York happened. It was like seeing a rainstorm far away. And um, everyone started to think to themselves, wait a second, how the hell are we going to treat this? Uh, we didn't have much and we didn't know anything about it. Um, so are my power, are my slides going through? Okay. Um, so in March of 2020, um, so in March of 2020, the main recommendations that we had was prone patients and use hydroxychloroquine. Um, and everybody knows how that uh, went. I think when historians look back, um, they will look at the fact that there was hydroxychloroquine just giving out like candy for everybody with COVID. It was kind of a weird phenomenon because it was in the headlines and that immediately translated to patient care. There was no double blind, randomized control studies, placebo controlled studies to say, hey, hydroxychloroquine works. Um, and the other information was like to prone if you have it. Um, but it was very unique in the sense that the medical literature was evolving in front of our eyes. Um, I was talking to colleagues on WhatsApp who were literally telling me that it was like a war zone out there, that um, patients were getting intubated. I remember a friend texting me, try to prevent intubations because of such a high mortality once the patient gets on a machine. Um, and then there was also people drinking Drano. So there's a lot of, a lot of confusion around that time. Um, so what, what I, one thing, one phenomenon within this whole, uh, process that I want to draw attention to is how the medical literature kind of evolved in a process of four months, uh, from March 15th to July 17th, we're in a totally different scenario. Um, so during this time, the conversation started to happen about the cytokine storm. The cytokine storm is essentially like your body's reaction to an infection, but the reaction is so harmful, it causes more damage than good. So it was around that time that uh, we were maybe April or May, we started to use these um, things such as D-dimer, procalcitonin, CRP, and ferritin, which slowly tried, started to show us the severity of illness. Um, for people not in medicine, we finally had something that we could treat this with. This was in um, April and May. So when we started looking at that, we realized that patients were extremely sick and getting the information from New York, uh, Washington, and other places that were affected, slowly we started to figure things out. Um, July 2020, we have come a very long way, alhamdulillah. Um, so the treatment and management of COVID has dramatically changed. Uh, it's not hydroxychloroquine, which has been outlawed by the F, not outlawed, but has does not recommend use as of June 20th, 2020, for any treatment of COVID. Um, alhamdulillah, we've come a long way. Uh, so what, one thing that is almost the standard of care now is steroids. Um, dexamethasone uh, is the one that was used in the study. So we have seen that all steroids are not as efficacious, but steroids are almost the standard of care whenever somebody has hypoxia or any lung involvement. This was not the case early on in the, in the pandemic. Um, so this is, I think, has all these treatments have led to what I believe is better um, outcomes, uh, 
people surviving their hospital stay a lot more. So I think all of these things on this slide show us uh, how far we've come in just four months. Um, anticoagulation on alone as blood thinners. So this is also a area of evolving uh, research, but what we what they did see on autopsies, and some journals have mentioned this, is that somewhere between 15 and 30 percent of people in the early stages, in the early days of COVID, were dying due to uh, pulmonary emboli, which are lung clots, which are causing people to die. Um, so now they're recommending blood thinners for anybody with severe uh, COVID. And that can be prolonged once they leave the hospital. So the next two medications, remdesivir and tecluzumab, these are the um, cytokine blockers per se. These are the ones that kind of made a big, big noise in the media, and uh, I think was kind of used to pump up the population to say, "Hey, a treatment's on its way." Um, these are IL-6 blockers. These are also given in severe. Um, COVID patients, moderate to severe patients who are requiring supplemental oxygen. Um, the other thing that's kind of uh, that I find very interesting is this covalescent plasma. Covalescent means it's taken from someone who's um, recovered from uh, COVID. So essentially, you're taking their antibodies and giving them to the next person so they can fight the infection. This is um, more. Uh, um, in the trial stages right now, uh, there's no good data right now that supports its use. Um, obviously, antibiotics uh, for existing co-infection, and people have tried novel things. People have heard about this uh, double lung transplant in a 19-year-old girl at uh, University of Chicago, which was quite remarkable. Um, so, alhamdulillah, I will say, getting diagnosed with COVID in March, 5th, March of 2020 versus July of 2020 is a huge difference, huge difference. We actually have treatment regimens that could hopefully help your survival. Um, other developments, uh, vitamin C and zinc, I will have uh, Dr. Madiha talk about that, uh, but I'll, also some data, good data on that. Um, and the, the one thing that's been in the, um, in the uh, news lately is this va vaccine uh, from New England Journal, of, it was in the New England Journal of Medicine, it was from Moderna, they did a 45, uh, they had 44, 45 participants um, from between the ages of like 29 and 55. And they tried this vaccine from those 45 patients. There's good results pretty much now, uh, which means they, they developed antibodies, which means the vaccine was uh, potentially could work. So now they're in the next phase of enrolling more participants to see if this could be uh, something that's applied more wi widely. Okay, so um, I just want to go through briefly with my experience with COVID. Um, one thing that you'll um, hear about, and then at the end of the day, this is the uh, khadr of Allah, and there's so much we don't know uh, from the previous slides. It may seem as though we've made a lot of strides. We have, but there are some very basic questions that we cannot answer. How long do your antibodies last? Um, what is its mechanism of transmissibility? Is it through ACs and like droplets? Yeah, we have a better idea, but it's not confirmed. So I would say, obviously, everyone is still wearing masks and gloves where appropriate. So anyways, but um, it started um, as a fever of 102.9. I was working that day, and it was Ramadan. And that was my first symptom was just having a pounding headache. Uh, and I was fasting. I was trying not to break it, so I put some... Uh, like a, like a ibuprofen gel on my head to see if uh, if it would go away, and it didn't. And so um, I uh, ultimately checked my temperature as one or two point nine. Ended up going to the ER uh, that day, and uh, they sent me home from work. Um, I did not think, considering what all these people were saying, that like if you're a relatively healthy person with no significant past medical conditions. Uh, that it would affect me so bad. Um, so I was actually in bed for 21 days, um, couldn't walk, and had severe muscle aches and pains. It took six weeks before I fully recovered. And um, it definitely put the fear of God into me. Uh, like it's, it's like somebody is constraining the bottom of your lungs. Uh, like somebody is like squeezing the bottom of your lungs. I could really feel it. Um, 
And right when I thought I was getting better, I would have a setback. Uh, by day five or six, uh, I started to feel, by day five, I was like, okay, I got this. But then um, as some of the research has shown, day five through nine is when the inflammatory response is most uh, most robust and can cause a lot of damage. Um, the treatment I did, because I was not having any uh, severe respiratory symptoms at that time, was vitamin C and zinc and, uh, and Tylenol to help with the fevers. Um, the psychological sequelae of COVID are starting to um, come to the surface because it's a very uh, isolating experience. Um, they call it mental fog of COVID. If you Google it, now there's articles coming out about how a lot of the people who survive COVID have either low-lying depression or um, need some sort of psychotropic medication to get over the hump. Uh, and the physiology behind that is that your body is so exhausted from trying to fight this, um, this virus that you're totally depleted of all your Neuro, neurotransmitters, serotonin, dopamine, uh, mood regulation. So that is something that's being looked into right now, especially for patients who've been on high flow oxygen or intubated or in the hospital for a prolonged period of time. Mental health is huge f subsequently after that. Um, so, so moral of the story um, is that this is very unpredictable. I just put this uh, picture of Habib and his dad, uh, Abdul Manap, like Dagestani MMA fighters. Uh, his father on the left, 57 years old, died of COVID complications. If someone showed me this person, I would think that, hey, they look relatively healthy. This guy still wrestles people and could do well. And that's, that's the most frightening thing about this disease right now is that it's very unpredictable uh, into who it affects. I've seen elderly patients who are 79 walk out of the hospital. I've seen 45-year-old never leave the hospital. So there is so much that we don't know. Finally, I think to the Muslim community, my message would be, this is not a conspiracy. Um, the WhatsApp messages uh, and things like that, that it's fake, it's not fake, uh, it exists, it's definitely there. We believe in Allah, we believe anything is possible by the power of Allah. Allah has put the entire world on freeze, on freeze. If somebody would have told you this one year ago, you would not have believed it. But subhanAllah, Allah is showing his might. And we don't know when this is going to end. There could be a second wave. There could be herd immunity. Allahu alam. Uh, I wanted to uh, reflect on this Surah 5, Ayah 32. Whoever saves a life as if he has saved all of humanity. And whoever saves a life as it is as if he, he has saved all of humanity. Um, I, think, I think about this frequently when people want to sacrifice the elderly per se to open the economy or I need to get back to work. But um, from my Muslim Islamic perspective, like we are the Ummah of Rasul Salah Salah. We're the Ummah of life. When somebody dies, they cannot come back. If you lose money, inshallah, we can make it back or we'll find ways to get through that. So my, my closing message is this, that these are still uncertain times. Take precaution. Do your best. Um, finally, the, the closing statement is dua and dawa. Uh, this is uh, absolutely necessary. We need, need to make dua. This is certainly an unstable time. And we also need to seek the best dawa or medicine that is uh, available to us. Jazakallah. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Shahbuddin. I can easily relate to what you said. I have seen close relatives who had similar COVID uh, infections and being a kidney doctor uh, one point from nephrology point of view is that this disease was a blood coagulating disease so our dialysis machines would clog in the beginning and we were struggling with heparin and stuff and then came out protocols uh, but uh, truly may Allah quickly recover you to your complete normalcy and and continue to give Shifa that you can help others are you are as you are doing alhamdulillah in all of your work around the globe uh, then i will quickly move on to our next speaker dr madiha saeed she is uh, her topic is holistic approach to covid19 she is also known as holistic mom she is an md board certified in family medicine and best-selling author 
of holistic treatments, your guide to healing chronic inflammation and disease, author of Adam's Healing Adventures, and also her new release, which is Living Quran and Sunnah to Optimize Health, Healing, and Save Our Future is going to come, inshallah, in 2021. She's Director of Education of Documenting Hope, writes regularly for holistic primary care and on Wellness Mama and a medical advisory board. She speaks internationally, igniting the world with her passion to ignite a healing revolution. She has appeared in numerous prestigious holistic online summits conferences, namely Mass ICNA, ICNA Mass, even for Dr. Terry Wall's conference, Academy of Integrated Health and Medicine. She's a regular on international Emmy-winning medical talk shows. And uh, Dr. Nandi Show, radio and print media. She's founder of the first Family Health Expo in the United States of America. Without further delay, I would like Dr. Madiha Said to take over from me. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Rabbi Shakhli Sadri wa Yasali Amri wa Hla Lukta Tamil Lisani Yafahu Kauli. Ya Rabbi Zidni Alma, Ya Rabbi Zidni Alma, Ya Rabbi Zidni Alma. Jazakallah khair for this opportunity. This is going to be, I'm very, I have to forewarn everybody, alhamdulillah. I'm super passionate about this topic, so I will keep this short and minimum to 10 minutes, inshallah. But there's so much more that I could say, so please ask questions um, if you do have any questions, inshallah. So I'll start with this. So subhanAllah, we are currently in a world and a time like no other. And subhanAllah, where conventional medicine, you know, there's so much that we're doing, but there's still so much that we don't know. And this ayah, when I went through the ayah, the, the Ramadan, I think, just like all of you, this is probably the best Ramadan I've ever had. <laughs> but uh, going through this ayah, this ayah specifically struck me. And I've talked to uh, scholars and scholars and scholars into the tafsir of this ayah, in these ayahs, so in depth. Where in Surah Nahal, ayah number 112, Allah says, I present an example of a city that was safe and secure. Its provisions coming to it in abundance from every location, but it denied the favors of Allah. So it became ungrateful and started misusing the, the favors of Allah. So Allah made it taste the environment of hunger and fear for what they have been doing. And certainly they came to a messenger from amongst themselves, but they denied him. So punishment overtook them while they were wrongdoers. Then what does Allah do to help that? Eat, what does Allah say right directly after that? Eat a wish that is halal and tayyib. And be grateful to Allah if it is indeed Allah that you worship, because that's super heavy. And this time specifically right now, we, we, we all have been giving a, given a time to reflect. It has shown us that, subhanAllah, that we were, what has COVID shown us? That yes, mental illness is on a rise, alhamdulillah. Yes, we've all chronic diseases were on a rise. But now when we were already living in a world of negativity and fear and hopelessness, and now we just add more negativity on top of that, it just goes overboard. Um, and now we're just in this chronic cycle of, um, you know, stress. And then we have this chronic conditions because those people with certain chronic conditions and comorbidities actually have altered immune system function leading to unhealthy forms of inflammation. And those people like obesity, diabetes, hypertension, old age, all these people have increased chances of developing virus severity. But you know what? This is Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam told us this long time ago because there's two blessings that most people are going to lose and that is their health and their free time for doing good but if we truly go back to those comorbidities of those people that are really getting sick of those people that are obese diabetes hypertension now these are lifestyle based diseases and that is something we do have control over yes there's so much we don't have control over but this lifestyle is something we do have control over so three-fourths of the population will die of a lifestyle related condition a bad diet kills about 11 million people a year. And this is what's really crazy, is that the Middle East and North Africa has, has a second highest increase of diabetes globally. And the number is projected to increase by more than 95% by 2035. So actually, this is a convergence of two epi uh, pandemics. Because, so let's go back. So yes, we understand that, okay, we're sick, we're negative. But then with the ayahs that I brought up to you is halal and tayyib. So what well, we know halal, you know, and I've heard of zibiha, I've heard of halal, but what is tayyib? And not until now do I really truly understand what tayyib is. That's good, beautiful, tranquil, peaceful, nutritious, safe. While the opposite is artificial GMOs, preservatives, toxins. 
And over and over, these are all the ayahs. That, I mean, not even all. These are just a little bit of the ayahs that Allah mentions. The importance of eating pure and uh, halal. So halal and tayyib. And otherwise, you're just wronging yourself. Over and over and over. And when Allah says something over and over and over, He really emphasizes it. But right now, we could sit down in a world where we're negative and we're like, oh my gosh, this feels like hopeless. Right? What's going on? Oh my gosh, we're all scared. We're sitting on inside of our houses. The only thing we can really do is, you know, cover our mouths and, you know, making sure that we're socially distanced, which is all good and great. But there's not much other hope besides for that, besides for just sitting around and waiting for somebody else to come up with a solution. And this is where Allah has never told you to sit around just wait somebody else to come up with a solution. He has told us to never lose hope. Because if Allah can split the sea, for the people of Israel, for the children of Israel to pass, when they had killed, when the Pharaoh had killed their children and they had lost their homes and they had lost everything. If at that time, when they were at this lowest of the low, at that time, if, if Allah sent down the ayah, the strongest language, and he uses the strongest language in the Quran, in Surah Ibrahim, ayah number seven, he says, I swear to it, I swear to it, I swear to it, I promise I'm going to increase you if we are just faithful. So if Allah can split the ocean, Allah can put any, not do anything, inshallah, because we have to remember that every single Saturday day, when you say, Ihdina Surat al Mustaqim, Ihdina Surat al Mustaqim, the past is in Allah's hands, the future is in Allah's hands. Guess what, uh, what I can do? Is the decisions that you make today, that is in your hands. And again, subhanAllah, where Allah says, you cannot change the condition of a people until, until you change what is within themselves. SubhanAllah. And just by putting, you know, your body back into balance by healing and improving and you know when you put your body back into balance by the choices that you make on a daily basis i have been practicing holistic medicine after i i myself used to deal with lupus and hashimoto's and digestive issues i don't have to deal with that anymore alhamdulillah i'm off of all medications all my antibodies are all normal and i have no symptoms and i've been able to help so many other patients over and over and over but how just by getting them back to the basics and the importance of your everyday decisions by lowering the overall inflammation. So subhanAllah, we talked about the cytokine storm. All of these things, what happens when our virus comes into your body, it forms an inflammatory response. And this inflammatory response can either be way too much, too little, you know, we want it just right, right? But if it's too much, it can cause problems. If it's too less, it can cause problems. But all of these diseases and symptoms are due to your body being off balance and your body being inflamed. And so again, there's two different types of inflammation. There's acute inflammation or chronic inflammation. Acute is a good thing. Chronic is basically there's too much triggers and it keeps on going on and on and on. And it basically destroys this magnificent masterpiece that we were born with. Then, subhanAllah, so let's go into what we do know is the importance of real food. And that's what I really want to select it because this is something that every one of us does have control. The things that we put in our mouth, because over and over and over, like our lifestyles are something that is in our control. The decisions that you make today are in our control. So I have my patients, in order to put lower the overall inflammation in your body, to optimize your immune system, so, so we realize that and to, you know, improve the overall chances of our body being more resilient and being able to fight anything that is, will, you know, throw out its way. We have to make sure we manage stress, sleep, social, and be spiritually positive. And then digestive health, nutrition, and detoxification. If you can put all of those pieces back into balance, you can lower the overall inflammation and heal not one symptom, inshallah, but then all of them simultaneously. And that is all I'm trying to do. I try to put people back into balance by focusing on these pieces. And just by doing that, people with autoimmune condition don't have that autoimmune issues anymore. People with oh, diabetes don't have diabetes anymore. People who have, you know, so subhanAllah, thyroid issues, who have autoimmune diseases, who have, you know, psychological disturbances, alhamdulillah, don't suffer from that anymore. And it really goes back to when Allah tells us about food. He tells about pure quality because we're going to talk about healing the gut. When Allah talks about, you know, food, he talks about eating a little bit, just one third, one third, one third, one third food, one third water, one third air. And then he talks about prophetic foods. Like why isn't, why is pomegranate and olives mentioned in the Quran 
while you know Skittles is not. So these are the things because right now we are enjoying ourselves as grazing livestock eat and Allah has this is the emphasis that Allah has put in the Quran is that he's told us that otherwise a fire will be a residence for them because then it opens those doors to shaitan so we have to make sure that we focus on not artificial foods because these artificial foods these fake foods these colorings these um you know yes the colorings in your biryanis the you know we have all of the artificial oils and we have candies and McDonald's and all of these artificial processed uh, foods or fast foods, all fast food chains can actually lead to more sickness. How? These basic 70 to 80% of our immune system lies in the gut. We have 100 trillion bacteria that line our gut lining and these bacteria are responsible for digestion, immunity, gene metabolism. They make 90% of our serotonin and 50% of our dopamine. SubhanAllah. So when you have put artificial food in, it actually causes this fire to come up and it leads to a weakened immune system. When you are put artificial food in, for example, cornflakes raises your blood sugar level higher than sugar does. So when we have artificial foods, the more processed it is, the more it raises your blood sugar level. Now you are, now we're because we talked about that diabetes, obesity, hypertension are leading to problems. Those are the people that are dealing with severe uh, comorbidities and mortalities in the severity of the virus complications. But that's really sc what's scary is that only 12% of the population is metabolically stable, while 88% of this population is metabolically unstable. And why? Because most of the population is a lot of them, like one out of every second person has prediabetes or diabetes, and 90% don't even know it. So here, we're also metabolically stable, unstable, because we are eating way too much sugar and processed foods, leading to a state called insulin resistance and prediabetes. And that then all of these things that I talked about, the insulin imbalances, the uh, gut imbalances, can lead to chronic disease, inflammation, and a weakened immune system. So these are the foods that we need to get rid of. If you are gonna do today, and these are things that you do have control over, is that you want to make sure you get rid of all of this artificial processed foods, toxic chemicals, sugar. Sugar weakens the immune system within hours after digesting it. With and it, it, it's it basically feeds all the bad bacteria and causes more problems. So we got to get rid of sugar, all forms of sugar. This is all pure poison, and um, all the soft drinks, all these cereals. All these mataya, I know this is why people don't like me very much because, but this is all artificial, it's sugar. Um, and on top of that, a lot of people are eating genetically modified foods. And these genetically modified foods are also leading to chronic conditions, um, along with a lot of people have food sensitivities. So just by like wheat and dairy, where wheat used to be 14 some chromosomes and now it's 44 some chromosomes where it's been so genetically hybridized, the body doesn't re respond to it. But if you really want to start somewhere to optimize your immune system, is we got to get rid of all of the fake food. Get rid of the candy, get rid of the sugar, and focus on these real foods. So focus on prophetic, nutrient-dense, Quranic foods that will help to balance your gut bacteria and your hormone levels and optimize your immune system and eat the colors of a rainbow, vegetables, clean protein, healthy fats. And these in and of itself are so tremendously beneficial because these are the foods that incorporate like vitamin D, you know, cod liver oil and sardines and eggs and mushrooms are vitamin D. And then we have vitamin C that comes from berries and spinach and tomatoes and citrus and Brussels sprouts and broccoli. So these are really, really important. But if we can get this through our diet, it makes it so much beneficial. So eat real foods, not fake foods. Whenever you're hungry, focus on your vegetables, clean protein and healthy fats. And then remember, diet was just one piece of the puzzle. When we talked about the beginning of the ayahs, Allah says that these people are just ungrateful. And unfortunately, this ungratitude, this ungratefulness that we are all really, as a Muslim ummah, suffering from, this ingra in ingratitude is one of shaitan's tactics to lead us off astray. So we have to, in order to really sur survive what's going on in the world around us, we need to make sure that 
We inc also incorporate gratitude into our daily routines. Immediately when you wake up in the morning, say 10 things that you're thankful for every single solitary day. Incorporate stress management techniques into your daily routine. And then there's so many supplements like zinc is antiviral and supports the immune system, glutathione, elderberry, that also strengthens the immune system, the MK cell function. And the list goes on and on, but specifically your vitamin D, your magnesium, omega-3s, probiotics, and then trying to get your mushrooms and all of the vitamin C, D, E, um, A, C, so all of these vitamins from your foods. So it's really all up to you. Our chances, we, what we have to do is we have to think, well, because Allah has given us a solution. We are Allah's creations. We are Allah's, our earth is Allah's creations. Our families are Allah's creations. These are an amana on us to take care of these the best we know how. This Quran has the answers to everything that we need. This Quran is our instruction manuals on how we are supposed to live the life to our optimal very best. And in that, Allah has said over and over and over, one of the main pieces, and now science is proving it, with so many doctors that are on the forefront of the microbiome and insulin resistance and inflammation, all talking about like, this is a key piece of the puzzle, is make sure you take away the foods that man-made and do not eat the foods that man-made and only focus on the foods that Allah made. And this is subhanAllah, I have all, these are my social media. My book is coming out next year and I have recipes and things on my website, Holistic Mom and JazakAllah. Thank you, Dr. Madhya. That was a nice presentation. I'm scratching my head. What should I eat tonight? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Really don't know. I need to go and buy some groceries again. Change my life. Uh, in all honesty, Alhamdulillah, uh, uh, just to be serious, what you said, Alhamdulillah, I have seen people changing in the last few years, but they need a lot of reminders like Mm -hmm. sisters like you who can encourage our other sisters so with regard to this uh, i want to tell all the viewers that we made sister madiha compress her talk so much she's phenomenal in talking so we have to just come up with a date nims has organized with dr madiha dr maryam and uh, miriam hussein who is an oncology fellow and dr juman the three sisters will take the stage. We will send the dates to you. It will be probably next two weeks or after ETH probably. And they will give phenomenal uh, message to our sisters and brothers and everyone. So we are looking forward to that. So with all you delay, the, the Alia who, who has done the backstage work, she is our mayor and backbone. I wanted to thank her for organizing this. Jazakallah. Sheikh Zishan. Now I would like uh, the Dr. Muhammad Harzella to just say a final word. What uh, what would you suggest us to do moving forward from psychological point of view? Uh, thank you very much. And again, it's a pleasure to be um, you know part of the this uh, you know um, really intriguing discussion to say the least. Um, there are many things actually many 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 things to consider whenever we think about the psychological aspect and the, the mental health related um, complexities. Um, from the immediate um, aspect of, of what we are currently encountering and to the immediate aftermath. And I think what really is very scary at this stage is, uh, in, in particular, is, is actually the so now we're facing an epidemic at the level of the infection, but the immediate aftermath could be an epidemic in terms of the psychological and the mental health. And we need to really be prepared for this, as not just as a society, but also as um, you know, as people who care about the well-being of humans. And in this context, um, we need to embrace the importance of societies and the importance of families and the importance of the de delivery of support. These days, the most efficient delivery system for mental health services is done by non-professionals. And therefore, we need to actually kind of educate families and educate parents and, and show people that actually, just a reflection of what I mentioned in my, in my brief talk, how these symptoms could be normal variations, how disease doesn't necessarily mean, you know, the expression of these, you know, setbacks, let me call them. And how can people cope with the current situation and how can they actually get the best out of it? 
And again, in a multidimensional aspect, because this is what we are as humans. At the very end, um, when it comes to COVID-19 and its immediate effect as an infection on mental and brain health, uh, there has been some studies. Um, I really cannot speak with confidence about any of them because, again, the numbers and the results are not supportive of, of uh, currently they're inconclusive at this point. Uh, but this is yet to be determined and yet to be actually further evaluated from a scientific perspective. Sure, Jazakallah. Uh, one quick thing for the three speakers. Uh, I know it's a burning topic. You guys can tell school. What do we do with the school? What do I do with the kids? Should I send them? Should I not send them? Because I know if I send them, they'll be carriers. This is psychological trauma. Which kid to send? Kindergartner should go or not? Or can they wear masks? All three speakers can chime in holistic approach or should we not be scared and how? How Dr. Shahbuddin, how Dr. Madiha and Dr. Herzilla, what, what do you just give for, for all of us, Justin? Yeah, I mean, it's a tough question, honestly. Um, it's one of those things that's definitely regional. Um, if you're in Florida or Texas, California at the moment, um, they're probably going to it really depends what happens in August, right? It depends what day school starts. Um, other considerations are what is your family structure? Do you Are you living with elderly folks? Do any of your children on medications, immunosuppressants, have any underlying uh, lung conditions that would predispose them to having a bad outcome? Um, taking all those things in totality, if the numbers are the way they are in Florida right now and... Um, you are living with an elderly person or you have some pre-existing medical condition, there's great options of tele, you know, tele-education, I guess. Um, so it's not an absolute, you know, in the last three or four months, the world's gotten very innovative in continuing services without being there physically present. Dr. Madiha, as a mom and as a physician and holistic, what, Please enlighten us what you think and what thought process you have. Absolutely. And I think that this will just continue to evolve as we start to see the numbers as it gets closer to the school year opening. But believe me, as my oldest is 12 years old and my youngest, this is the first time I will have all four kids in school. Now I can't send them to school. <laughs> thinking about but despite that despite the fact that i guess i do want them to leave the house i'm kidding no but um subhanallah you got we who live with my grandma so to be really cautious again it's all about prevention right now because there's not such great treatment options out there prevention is really important so an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure and the, for me, that prevention, wearing a mask, social distancing is all first and foremost, along with um, if we don't need to send them to school, um, I, I have chosen that too. So we'll, that that's mine. But as soon as, you know, but then again, that's, that's per household, per person um, basis and depending on where they are um, in the world. So that all really is important to take a look at. But again, the, while they're here with us, to really emphasize the importance of taking care of your bodies, to taking care of your bodies, alhamdulillah, is super important. And that starts with taking care of every single bite that we take and our thoughts that we put in our body. So gratitude and fear food is really where, where I have all my care with and my family to really optimize our health and well-being, inshallah. And Dr. Taj and Dr. Nagamia, any final statements for us? Uh, for our, you guys have been experienced in the world, and you have seen Dr. Nagamia being a surgeon, Dr. Taj being a cardiologist. You have gone through life and death situation in fraction of seconds in the OR. Anything for our young viewers? Anything what you want us to do? Don't. Well, I think, don't uh, thank you for uh, allowing me to uh, interact. Uh, I think that you know. It's way beyond my uh, specialty, uh, the COVID-19, but I've been observing and following all the things that have been happening. But I think this is a lesson that we have to learn that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala causes us to uh, encounter difficulties, but you have to face them with, with, uh, uh, with humility, with uh, 
always understanding and learning as much as you can about the disease before you trust it on the patients. Obviously, you've seen the results of our inattention of some of our politicians and stuff as to what disastrous result it can, can uh, happen. And that not only affects individuals, but it affects communities. And that's very, very important, I think. But uh, before we uh, conclude, it's been a, such an excellent seminar. I think all the speakers were high caliber and we, we intend to bring you uh, very uh, high caliber uh, speakers in the future, inshallah. This will become a regular feature, at least monthly, if not bi-weekly. And we want you to join. We hope to provide some uh, question and answer session in the future. We have some technical limitations at the moment, but uh, as we improve our techno technology, we will uh, invite you to participate. Uh, the, uh, I want to also let you know that this uh, seminar has been recorded and will be on our website. So you can go and, uh, you know, at your leisure, uh, review the whole thing and uh, also uh, uh, see what the, what the speaker said. And you can send us questions. We, we have a Facebook and we have a YouTube presence. So you can actually be sending us questions uh, and we can be emailing you the answers. So that's another thing. Again, I thank all the speakers. I thank Ali especially because she is the backbone of the uh, entire effort that was uh, used for the results for today. We will keep on improving. We had some technical problems, but uh, this is all new to us right now. And hopefully we we will improve as we as we go along. So I'll uh, let uh, Taj do the final word. Yeah, Dr. Taj, please. Yeah, I think the salam alaikum. Uh, I was uh, listening to these speakers very keenly. Uh, I think we we cannot succumb to to the disease. We need to be brave, cautious, uh, believe in faith and in Allah. Uh, I think that's probably the only way. And use common sense. Uh, the virus does not discriminate whether you're Republican or Democrat. Are a Muslim or a non-Muslim. So these precautions are for everybody. It's actually the prophetic uh, message to all of us. This is what he recommended to us. And when the recommendation was when there's an epidemic or pandemic, we are allowed to stay in one place and not travel, not spread the disease. So this is as old as prophetic time. I think we follow our own religion properly. And uh, in a halal tayyab way, the way it's, uh, Dr. Saeed was talking about, inshallah, we'll come out of it. If in future, we will probably have more detailed individual presentations. So I really thank the moderator and, uh, and our speakers. Thank you so much. Thank you. Jazakallah all. We are well over time, so please get back to your families. Make sure no sugar to the families tonight. <laughs> <laughs> Follow Dr. Badiha's advice. Yes. Okay. Salaam alaikum. Jazakallah. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Please don't leave. We have a special dua uh, by the Hafiz Mufti Zishan, who initially did, but because of technical errors, we were not able to come to you guys. And the other thing is we can, all of the speakers can come and I want all three speakers to say one line what you want us to learn tonight. Just one line and then we can move to this one. Okay, so I, I think uh, I was put on. Um, um, so inshallah, perhaps the speakers could do that after me. Um, can everyone hear me now? I know there's a little bit of technical difficulty the first time. I apologize about that. Uh, but now, alhamdulillah, everyone can hear. Um, so I will uh, give a short dua. I think it was planned to do this at the very end, but that's fine. Um, I'll do the short dua, and then afterwards, inshallah, we can have um, the panel come back on, how Dr. Shakir was saying, and um, he can, uh, uh, and then everyone can give their final words. So um, we'll just make a short dua. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen, wa salatu wa salamu ala Sayyidil Anbiya wa Mursaleen, Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in amma ba'd. Ya awal al-awaleen, ya akhir al-akhileen, ya dhal quwwat al-mateen, ya rahim al-masakeen, ya arham al-rahimeen. 
Ya Allah, Ya Rahman, Ya Rahim. Ya Allah, we ask you to forgive us of our sins. Ya Allah, forgive us of all of our sins, Ya Allah. The sins that we commit knowingly, the sins that we commit unknowingly. Ya Allah, the sins that we commit intentionally, the sins that we commit unintentionally. The sins that are big, the sins that are small. Ya Allah, forgive us of all of our sins. And Ya Allah, give us protection from our sins. Ya Allah, give us protection from all of our sins, Ya Allah. Uh, the sins that we have committed previously, and Ya Allah, any sin that we have not committed, Ya Allah, give us protection from all sins. And Ya Allah, we ask you to have mercy upon us. Ya Allah, grant us whatever khayb the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam asked for. And we ask you protection from whatever the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam sought protection from. Ya Allah, we ask you to bless us, bless our families, bless our wealth, put barakah in all that we do, Ya Allah, in our time, in our health. Ya Allah, give us blessings and bless us more, Ya Allah. And Ya Allah, allow us to use what you have given us in a way that is pleasing to you. Allow us to use our wealth, our time, our energy, our bodies, our health in a way that is pleasing to you, Ya Allah. Ya Allah, cure everyone that is sick, Ya Allah, throughout the world, whatever sickness they may have. Ya Allah, we ask you to cure them of their sickness, Ya Allah. Ya Allah, for all those who are sick with COVID-19, Ya Allah, we ask you to cure them of the coronavirus. Ya Allah, we ask you to give them shifa. Ya Allah, we ask you to protect us all. And Ya Allah, we ask you to remove this, uh, this, this virus from us, Ya Allah, to remove it so that we can um, do things as normal, Ya Allah. Attend the masajid as normal, Ya Allah, and do uh, our ibadah in interaction and socialize as we normally would do, Ya Allah. Allow us to take benefit from the time, from this uh, entire situation, from this ordeal. Allow us to learn from it and to uh, take lesson from it, Ya Allah. And allow us to use whatever we have learned from it in a way that is pleasing to you, Allah. Allow us to take advantage of our time to frequent those things that we should have been frequenting before coronavirus, Ya Allah. The masajid, Ya Allah. The places of learning, Ya Allah. Spending in, in the way that you are pleased with, Ya Allah. Allow us to take lesson from those things um, and, and, to, and to change those things in a way that we are uh, pleasing you, Ya Allah. Ya Allah, we ask you to cure all of those who are sick. And Ya Allah, if it's not written for someone to be cured, then Ya Allah, take them in a way that is uh, that is easy, Ya Allah. Grant them Jannah, Ya Allah. For anyone who is suffering from a terminal illness or they're very weak, Ya Allah, um, and, and Ya Allah, it is written that they're going to pass soon, Ya Allah, allow them to pass in a way that is very easy for them. Ya Allah, with Iman, with belief in you, Ya Allah, and grant them Jannah. And for all of those who have passed away from this Ummah, Ya Allah, any of our family members and anyone from this Ummah, Ya Allah, grant them Jannah, Ya Allah, without any hisab, without any adab. And Ya Allah, allow us all to be among those whom we are pleased with. Uh, accept this institute for that which is pleasing to you. Allow this institute, Nagamiya Institute, to be uh, used. Um, uh, allow it to give beneficial knowledge and, and uh, benefit the community, Ya Allah, in a way that is pleasing to you. Ya Allah, reward all of the speakers, Ya Allah and uh, uh, bless them all for their time and give them barakah in, in their work and in their time. So Allah Ta'ala ala khayri khalqihi Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in bi rahmatika ya arhamar rahimin.